With what we were just discussing, a lot of this business is very much you know relationship based, and what we really need to do is work together as a team, both as an agent but also as the lender, um, you know, to help our clients kind of um, get through everything. So, um, if you guys got any questions with any of these slides, feel free to stop me, and we'll kind of go through them. But you know, one uh, one kind of analogy we like to use in our company when describing how the process should really go is that we're all rowing in the same direction. Obviously, at any point in time, um, between like agent and lender, if we're rowing in separate courses, you know, we're obviously steering our clients in, in different paths. But if we're cohesive in the direction that we're moving, the process just goes a lot more smoothly. So we're going to kind of touch base on that uh, a, a lot here today. So in the beginning, you know, um, you know, first step with you guys as an agent is you're obviously faced with uh, finding out if your if your client's even going to be qualified. So, um, you know, at, in, in the beginning it was a pre-qualification, um, and, and you you didn't want to start that process until you had that letter in your hand because you don't know exactly where your client's at. You don't know what their financials look like. You don't know how much liabilities they have. None of that. However, Van Dyke Mortgage, we take it a little bit further and, and kind of how we just discussed in the previous meeting, we fully pre-approve your clients. Now, what does that mean? What's the difference between a pre-approval and a pre-qualification? So a pre-qualification in, in short and sweet, it, it, as we touched base off in the last class, it's nothing more than just like a verbal interview. It, it's, you know, Getting, asking the questions, the right questions, to get an idea for how strong of a client is that buyer going to be. And then basically making an assumption based off the information you gathered, whether or not it's gonna be honest or, or honest or not or true, that's, that's one of the downsides of a pre-qualification. With a pre-approval letter with us, there's a lot more that gets done. So we can either sit with your client, speak with your client over the phone, or have them do an online application we have both Spanish speaking and English speaking people to help them with that. Um, first thing we're going to do, we're going to get their basic information. You know, we're going to find out the residency history, you know, name, date of birth, social. We're going to run a tri merge credit report, figure out exactly where their high and their low scores are, as well as their middle. So we can drop their high, drop their low, go with their middle score. So we have their full credit history. Um, then we're going to import their liabilities. So now we know exactly if they have any, uh, you know, outstanding, uh, you know, installment loans that are kind of behind, credit card payments that are behind. You know, do they have auto vehicles that are being financed, student loans? Um, we'll have an idea for what their monthly liabilities already look like before we even throw a mortgage into the picture. Um, and then from there, we'll gather in, in employment information with regards to how long they've been at their job, um, income information with regards to, you know, realistically, what are they pulling in every single month? Are they self-employed? Are they W-2'd? Are they pay stubbed? You know, do they basically just file business income off their tax returns? All of this information basically is what's getting compiled into making with what we are um, is a pre-approval letter. You have a a much better understanding of where your client is with a pre-approval than obviously with pre-qualification. So we'll, we'll provide that to you before you even take your clients, put them in a car and start looking at some properties. And this is totally free with us. Um, so there's no charge in, in doing that. Quick question for you. Sure. Quick. Now that is uh, your, the client coming in to Van Dyke itself or can we do, can that we can be do done that over the phone. Okay. Yeah, we can do that over the phone as okay. well. We, we go through that, that process, you know, it, it, it can take probably upwards of an hour, sometimes longer, you know, if they have rental properties, multiple businesses and things like that. But yeah, we deal with clients that are out of state, you know, um, some that are out of the country. So um, obviously we have other resources and ways to do this. I know Sean's done, you know, a Skype interview and uh, a, a, a Skype video chat one time. So um, we do have multiple mediums to kind of communicate with your clients. Now, one other important change, as we discussed in the other class as well, is as of July of this year, you know, credit reports now do no longer contain the collections and the judgments automatically as they would normally populate on the credit report. Now, that's important because with judgments, liens, collections, and all those negative derogatories for your clients, 
that can obviously put a hold and a big stunt in, in closing on a, a home that you may have already gotten under contract. Obviously finding out if they have twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 outstanding that they owe on, or that has not been you know, remediated, that can be a major uh, pre-closing issue that the underwriters would wanna show satisfactory. Now, when you work with us, we do pull this information. We do have a, a system in place now where we can pull up that public information and find out specifically if those clients do have any outstanding issues that we need to be aware of that can prevent us from closing. So, and you know, I guess one of the major reasons why a lot of lenders wouldn't be doing this is there's obviously a cost associated with this. Now, we basically see this as a cost of just doing business, but um, you know, it's one thing that we like to do to kind of separate us from the rest. So let's say you guys got your pre-approval, the client's good to go, um, and they're ready to really start the process. So now you're throwing them in the car, you're taking them out, showing them homes that they may be interested in based off your buyer's, buyer's consultation. So what happens next? You find a home, where do we go from here? Well, most lenders will tell you they need 30 days from the date that they get the contract. Um, but the process kind of is a little bit more than just that. Um, especially after you know the housing market collapse and stuff, there's a lot more um, compliance things and timelines that we need to be aware of that can potentially um, cause delays and in, in, in when we can specifically close. So we do need 30 days from the date that we receive the fully executed contract. So how does that kind of impact us when you guys are writing your offers? Well, on average, we went back and we took a look at exactly how much time it took from a time that a contract offer was written, provided to the sellers, to the time that we had a fully executed contract back in our hands with the initial needed documentation to fully start proceeding moving forward. And that day was between the fourth and the fifth day. So realistically, when you guys are, are writing your offers, it's beneficial for us, so we're all rowing in the same direction, to probably write that contract um, offer out, you know, 34 days or so from what the current date is that you're, you're writing it on. It'll just make things move a lot more cohesively and smoothly. So, some things to be aware of that you should probably inform your client on. Um, when taking a look at your offer, you're gonna have a few things and a few fees that the buyers are gonna to need to be aware of. The first one obviously being the escrow deposit. Now what your escrow deposit is, is basically kind of like your, your down payment to the title company, to the sellers, in good faith that um, obviously we're serious about purchasing this home. We're gonna put some money up front in advance um, to let you know that we're serious about purchasing your home. Now, this money goes towards their, their total cash out of pocket at closing um, from the amount that's being financed. Um, but in an event that they were to remove themselves from being under contract without a valid excuse or a valid reason, that money is at risk. So um, unless you have like an appraisal issue where there is a value issue, um, unless the inspection doesn't go as well as you had planned, um, in case of a Category 5 hurricane coming through and sweeping through your state and probably causing some pre-closing issues with the structure uh, itself, this money, for the most part, is, is secured and uh, you know it's going to go towards the transactional expenses. But if any of those reasons aren't met, um, or, or a few others that are obviously situational, then that money um, is basically what you would jeopardize and put at risk should you just remove yourself from being under contract. Um, home inspections. So a, a home inspection is, is not required by us as the lender, but it's certainly something that we always advise our clients to get, especially when it comes to um, a four point and a wind mitigation if a property should call for it or if it should make you know logistical sense, because that can save them a good bit of money on their homeowner's insurance policy. Um, so definitely have a conversation with your clients about getting a home inspection and also taking a look at getting a four-point inspection um, to help them save on their insurance. 
And then lastly, the appraisal fee. So the appraisal fee, that can vary um, from program to program. You know, it, it'll, it'll be uh, about $500, $550 or so on an FHA appraisal. Conventional, we're probably looking at $425, $450 on a conventional. Um, and, uh, you know, with their appraisal fee, we need to make sure that they are fully aware that that is not a uh, fee that they pay for at closing. That is an upfront expense, I guess, to, to going under contract. They're gonna pay that in advance. So formal application, let's talk about this next. So if the buyer did not do a true TBD, now what a TBD is in, in our company's uh, terminology, we refer to TBDs as to be determined files. Now one program that we're really starting to push is when we have a, a client or a lead or um, a buyer that we know that's needing to get financed, we're really now starting to really push this TBD program because what it allows us to do is to underwrite a file in advance. Basically, before we even have a property or anything like that, if we gather all their documentation in advance, we can pretty much underwrite the entire file without the property information so that we know their assets are good, their income is good, um, that they're good up to you know X amount. We can iron out all the conditions that would need to be met specific to that client. So once we do find a property, we can order an appraisal right away and then we can close fast. It also gives you peace of mind that should you have I guess a client that might be on the fringe, let's say they're, they're very tight with credit, um, you know, there's some specifics to their unique situation that we would want an underwriter obviously to check in advance before taking them out and showing them homes. We can have all of that done in advance so that you have a little more peace of mind before, you know, obviously taking them out and showing them a bunch of properties. But in the event that, you know, you obviously did not do a TBD file, then the actual application process really has not begun. You know, um, you, we're just now beginning kind of the financing portion of the transaction. So as it says here, the real estate agent must ensure that the buyer makes the formal application within the time frame that's given on the contract. That's, that's important now. This step is sometimes forgotten and the buyer is out of the contract because they missed that deadline. At this time, all disclosures are signed, all documentation is collected, and the money for the appraisal is collected. Now at this point, when this is done, that's when, whoops, that's when we actually start going to work. So day one, the file is submitted to processing and an official loan file is opened. Okay, so this is when the mortgage process itself is, is really beginning. So we're submitting this into processing and, and we're starting to finally um, process, underwrite, and originate you know, this file. So day two, the appraisal is ordered. Now, the appraisal is ordered on day two if we have the inspection already done. Now, kind of coincidingly, that kind of places some emphasis on why we want to get the inspection ordered right away as soon as we go under contract, because an appraisal can be a holdup when it comes to timing. So make sure we have the cash, but um, that currently appraisals are taking between five and 10 days. Now, that's when title is ordered. So we must know who the title company is that's up front that's gonna be handling the transaction. Then we'll go ahead, we'll get all the title docs ordered. Fraud guard, which is a basically kind of like a background check to see if there's any um, governmental holds or um, identity theft issues or things like that that can pop up on a buyer, which there are red flags that do occur from time to time. Um, if someone's been put on an international list, you know, a terrorist <laughs> list or something like that, these are all things that we basically have to do to check on prior to closing. This is when the tax transcripts are ordered. Currently, those are taking between two and five days. Intro letters are also sent out then to the buyers as well as both the agents on the transaction as well, both buyer and seller side. So everyone's fully aware of who's gonna be um, originating, processing, and underwriting this file. And then lastly, if you have a buyer that has bonus, overtime, commission, uh, they have a second job, um, there's some discrepancies on tips or, or how their income is calculated. Um, we're also ordering verifications of employments 
on those clients up front in advance. However, normally if you don't have those items, if we still need to order what's known as a verification of employment and that's when this, this process occurs for just regular pay stubs or, or, or generic straightforward clients with how they receive their pay. All right, continuing on to day two. If a credit, credit supplement is needed um, for a variety of reasons, that process would start here. For FHA loans, case numbers are ordered and we generally get those back same day. VA loans, we obviously need to obtain the COE or the Certificate of Eligibility, which illustrates what their benefits are gonna to be towards purchasing this property because obviously VA loans are backed and they get some sort of entitlement uh, for that. All right, also um, at this time, we'll be checking with the sellers or, or have you as the agent check with the sellers to find out if the sellers already have a copy of their survey for when they purchased the property. In event, in cases that they do have a copy of the survey and there hasn't been any changes to um, the, the property's guidelines or adding any wells or, or septic tanks or anything like that that can possibly disrupt how a survey is showing on a property. In those instances, we can actually then reuse the survey and save our, uh, save our clients $290 of not having to order a new one. All right, so day three. Day three is when the processor starts scrubbing the file and sends basically their first initial look um, to the loan officers or, or ourselves. This kind of gives us a good insight for where the file is at, if there's gonna be any additional items or documentation we should be aware of that we should be calling for. Um, the processor makes their intro calls, introducing themselves to the buyer, and you know, obviously going over that first look as well. And then the uh, processor makes a call to the buyer's agent to introduce themselves to them as well. All right, so day four. So ideally, no later than day four, the borrower should have received some sort of insurance quotes. We at Van Dyke, or, or over here on the Miller team, uh, we try to get two courtesy quotes uh, for insurance that we can provide to our clients just so they have something to compare. And uh, if they have a good relationship with speaking with one of the insurance reps, then obviously the convenience of having that already done um, by us for, you, for your clients. Um, but insurance is something that a client can certainly shop for. So um, you guys can go, if you have a relationship with an insurance agent, find out, get a quote for insurance. Once you have that quote, please provide it back to us so that we can go ahead and get that insurance policy uh, bound for the closing date and uh, get it locked in for the file. The biggest delay for what we're seeing our loans getting processed and underwritten is insurance because insurance is a trid ready guideline without the insurance policy bound with enough days in advance insurance can potentially hold us up from closing um, specifically perfect example we have a hurricane coming right now um, probably here shortly if not already today but you know sometime later this week insurance companies are probably going to put a temporary stunt or a suspension on writing new policies um, and policies that they've already issued quotes for that have not been bound yet, that also could cause a potential delay for things that are gonna be um, closing here shortly as well. So insurance is definitely, definitely a major part of, uh, of the transaction that should not be you know, overlooked. And, and generally we say the sooner a buyer can work on insurance, the better. All right, so days three to 12, once all the documentation is received and reviewed, and the file um, will be submitted to the underwriter for obviously loan commitment and approval. So at this point in time, you know, it takes a little bit of time for the underwriter to obviously get into the file once it is submitted, generally between 24 and 48 hours. Um, but it's during this time period that we should see, hopefully the appraisal comes back from the appraiser um, and it either gets, you know, sent into collateral review if there's any issues or to the underwriter to verify that everything's through and through and good. Um, in the meantime though, status reports are going out throughout this process to all parties involved, you know, making everybody, you know, abreast of what's happening with the loan and, and fully aware. Okay, so here's an example of what a status grant is. And this is part of our perfect loan process over at Van Dyke. So as you can see, there's a lot of different items that are illustrated and 
uh, different things that are identified. So you have your processing order date, the due dates, or the dates that things are received, as well as when the underwriter has approved stuff. But you can see there's item, line items for the appraisal, for the title commitment, if there's any title docs that are outstanding. Um, insurance, do we have that back? You know, the survey, is there any other outstanding borrower docs? And then what's nice about this is this gets emailed to everybody, but then the processor will go in and they'll actually input if there's specific items that we're still waiting on. Um, you know, kind of going back to the analogy of rowing in the same direction, we want to make sure everybody, we have an open level of communication that if there is anything that's missing, that everyone's fully aware of it and so that we can all help push everybody to get to the closing table because the last thing that we want is, uh, is obviously miscommunication or a delay in communication that could obviously cause a delay in closing because we're all trying to close quickly and smoothly. All right, so day 12, the files return to the processor and it either has a suspension, which nobody wants, because that's generally an issue, or conditional approval. If we get the conditional approval at this point in time, a loan commitment can now be issued. And I know a loan commitment for you guys is one of the compliance things that you require, um, getting a copy of like a loan estimate and a loan commitment um, so that you can submit that to compliance so you're all ready for receiving your funds um, once, once you are paid. Now, if the lender is ordering a survey on the buyer's behalf, it is basically ordered now because that takes a few days to have the title company go ahead and order it or having us order it, whoever orders it, it's gonna take a few days to get that back. So we go ahead and we order the survey now once we have a good understanding and identification exactly where the file's at with, with regards to conditions and outstanding docs. All right, so between days 12 and 19, whoop, the conditions are now being gathered. So, you know, we request all of our items up front in advance with regards to what we need documentation wise. However, um, in some instances, there aren't any conditions that are called for, but in most of the time, most situations, the underwriter's gonna identify some additional documentation that we need, whether it be additional bank statements to provide adequate proof of funds, um, you know, in events that you have um, discrepancies over uh, an item, let's say someone had a bankruptcy or a divorce or there is child support payments, there's always gonna be possible more documentation that needs to be provided. Unfortunately, we sometimes say conditions lead to more conditions and documentation leads to more documentation. That's only because um, there's always the possibility that with, with more information, it will lead to more validation or verification of whatever it is that we're trying to prove. Um, so during this time, we're basically gathering up the conditions from the client and, uh, and getting that into processing so that they can submit it back into underwriting. And again, at this point in time, this is probably the most stressful. It's important that we're just all rowing in the same direction so that we're getting us to the closing table. All right, so days 20 to 21, conditions are resubmitted back into underwriting in the hopes of getting our final approval. Status reports go out again, and hopefully at this point in time, we receive our approval then. So that's when we carry over to the next line. So around day 23, this is when a file must be trid ready. Um, so what does that mean exactly? We kind of discussed some of these, but you know, in order to be trid ready, we need to have our appraisal back without any um, subject to repair items or, or outstanding items that the appraiser called for on the property. The homeowners and the flood insurance, um, those would need to be, the quotes need to be back in and those need to be bound in advance. We need to have our conditional approval and uh, in events or situations where we have like seconds on a property, um, in, in events like uh, someone's utilizing the first time home buyer or the, or the state of Florida's bond funds, we would need to make sure that we have our lock uh, done and confirmed um, about 15 days before uh, the file is expected to close. So we need to make sure that the file's locked. We have all the title docs. And uh, at, at this point, we're seven, seven calendar days prior to the closing date, we are now trade ready. We need to have that because if we don't have any, any of these items, then we're obviously extending out day by day until we meet our trade ready guideline. So seven days prior to closing. 
All right, so days 22 to 23, QC or quality control is reviewing and clearing to close the file. So hopefully we get our clear to close. Once we have our clear to close, we're basically now stating that as a lender, we reviewed this file in full and everything is going to go through. We, we have our full final approval on the file. All the conditions are met, underwriting has checked off and uh, we're now working towards closing. All right. So now between days 23 and 24, the loan package is prepared and sent to the closing agent. At this point in time, this is basically the balancing act between our closer on our side and our back of house is working with a title agent to find what their fees and balance sheet is gonna look like with regards to the um, cash due at closing. Um, it's a process that basically goes back and forth between our closing agent and the title's closing agent so that by the end of it, what they're showing as the cash to be collected or due at closing is also matching up with ours. Until both parties come to some sort of um, agreement where they match in full, that process continues to happen. Um, and then following that, that's when we meet our closing day and everyone's happy. So um, clearly there is a lot that kind of goes on during the loan process and, and with the timeline of everything, there's a lot that can cause hiccups in the road, which is again, just why we ask, you know, we're both partners in business. We're trying to help you grow your business. You're helping us grow ours. Um, if we can be on each other's team, it makes the process a lot, a lot more smoothly. So what is the 10 most common causes of mortgage delays? Number one, slow to submit the requested docs to the lender. So that can be everything from pay stubs, to bank statements, to driver's license, to investment accounts, um, even um, bankruptcy documents or, 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 or issues with, with a divorce, anything that we're calling on, there's generally a good reason for why we're calling on it. Um, the longer it takes for the client to get us these items, obviously the longer we are postponing reviewing them and clearing these conditions. So that's number one. Number two, not signing the e-consent upfront. So when we get a contract, before we can even email and issue the disclosures out to a client, we need them to acknowledge that they're willing to accept um, basically online documentation and disclosures to be sent to them and handled throughout this process. Before, they, before we can send that, they need to acknowledge that. And one of the major delays is people just not checking their email and uh, I guess not handling that, that e-consent in an adequate time frame. And then another one, kind of following the same suit would be a delay in signing their initial loan disclosures. So once we do have the consent, we do have the disclosures prepared when we send those to the client via the web portal or whatever the case might be, any delays that we possibly have with getting those initial disclosures back, that obviously is gonna delay the point at which the loan process is really gonna begin on day one. Um, so any of these items can cause that, that four and a half day window of time on average that we see from the day we actually have a fully executed contract to day one of when the loan process really begins, any of these items can certainly extend on that. So these are definitely things to be fully aware of. Number four, processing and underwriting is not done in house. Now with us, our processing and underwriting is done, it, it is done in house and it's done here locally. Our, uh, our processing, underwriting, management, leadership, all of that is local here, um, just over the bridge in Feather Sound over in Pinellas County, which makes things a lot quicker. Um, number five would be not getting a home inspection done um, sooner rather than later. So when you guys go under contract, one of the things that we first advise is schedule a date with the sellers on when you can have your home inspection done. That's obviously gonna put a delay from when we can order our appraisal. So the sooner you can schedule a home inspection and have an inspector out to the property, the better. Number six, not quickly ordering an appraisal. So once you do have a home inspection done, 
or in the event that you're not choosing to do a home inspection, communicating with us when a good time is to go ahead and to proceed with the appraisal order. Um, obviously, we don't want to order an appraisal if we know there is either an outstanding issue on the inspection that you're trying to negotiate with the sellers. Um, let's say the inspection didn't go well, your client as the buyers had a couple problems with the home. You want to get that all addressed prior to us ordering an appraisal um, just so that there's not more money tied up that's at jeopardy. <clears throat> Number seven, as we discussed, one of the worst delays is not getting insurance or getting insurance back to us in a quick enough time frame. As we know, that's a trid ready guideline. We need this sooner rather than later. Number eight, not giving the lender or the title agent all the addendums up front or all along the way. So if, uh, if there's been a separate addendums done to the contract, you'll any time that you're handling that back and forth between buyers and listing agent, also CC the lender on that as well because we need to supply that to the underwriter and to processing so that they have the most accurate information. Number nine, the borrower and or the seller is not expediting requests. So this kind of goes back to the conditions. There needs to be some sort of sense of urgency. Obviously we can't just lose a few days when items are requested. So having them jump on those sooner rather than later. And then last, which in my opinion is, is, is something that's probably should be up a little bit higher on the list is when we're fully approved and we have our clear to close and we finally have our closing disclosure balance between the seller's uh, the, the title agent and our closing agent, when the initial CD or the preliminary CD, which is a closing disclosure, goes out to the borrower, that has to be signed three days prior to closing. You know, sometimes we see clients receive it they review it, they don't sign or execute it, and they wait a couple days before getting it back to us. That's just to postpone their closing date by however long they waited. Um, we try to do our best to get it to them as quick as we possibly can, so we don't have any delays, but um, in some instances, when we, you know, when, we, when we send them their CD, and we tell them we need it signed and executed by midnight, we need it signed and executed by midnight. If there's anything that needs to get ironed out or addressed, we can certainly go back in once it's been signed and executed the next day, make the needed adjustments and corrections and still close by the uh, adequate time frame. So. so as a partnership between the real estate agent, the title company and the lender, just remember to give the benefit of the doubt to whom you partner with. If we undermine or criticize each other, the buyer and seller hears that and it lends to a bad experience. Remember, none of us are hired hands by each other. We are hired by the buyers and or the sellers to complete our part of the transaction. No belittling or bullying. We are not adversaries, but a partnership with one common goal in mind, and that's obviously to reach our closing. So um, it just kind of further emphasizes and places the importance that while we're undergoing this process and, and working together, if I can have your back in supporting what you and a conversation you may have had with the client as to why we're, we're, we're pursuing one route with an offer or whatever the case might be. It's the same reason why, you know, if you're backing us up when we're requesting to get certain items back that there's been a delay, just to have each other's back during the transaction will we'll kind of bring both parties um, in a win-win situation or in a win-win light to, to, to get us to the closing table as smoothly as possible.